This morning, before we turn to our passage, I was, I was thinking this week about my days in junior high. And um, I haven't really done much in the way of weightlifting since junior high or freshman year. But when I was in eighth grade, uh, probably my weightlifting hit its peak. And I was, like many other junior high boys, exercising all three muscle groups, biceps, biceps, and biceps, right? When you're in junior high, the only muscles that you think about in your body tend to be the ones in your arms, <laughs> seemingly. And um, I think that I fell under that, that deception as well. <clears throat> but I can remember one of my coaches, I think it was probably Mario, or the, although I was probably told it by Coach Vergrenick too, my football coach, that actually if you want to strengthen your arms, if you want to have strong arms, you, you're foolish if you only exercise your biceps, or your triceps, or your, your forearms. That you actually, to grow in real strength, need to grow and strengthen your core, right? You need to strengthen your core and your legs and your rear and your, and your sh shoulder muscles. The, the things that you may not think about as much um, really affect your arm strength. And I remember him telling me that and telling other young men that. And uh, did it change what we worked out in the weight room? I'm not so sure. But uh, they had a point. They had a point. There's different sources of strength in the body, right? Um, but this actually plays into all of life. You know, you think academics, school. What's your source of strength in school? Well, Intellect is a source of strength. That's probably the one that may come to your mind most quickly. But there are other sources of strength. Maybe for, for some of us, intellect is not you know, a, a really bright intellect where you retain information easily and you learn easily. It doesn't come naturally. And so maybe your source of strength in school is just having an attitude that's tenacious about studying, putting in the hours, right? The tortoise and the hare thing. You may not get things easily, but you put a time in, and that's your source of strength. Or maybe for some of us, the real source of strength is just the mercy of the teacher. It's not so much the intellect or the, the amount of time we put in. All throughout life, there are various sources of strength. Some of them we think about more than others. This morning, I've titled the sermon, The Source of Your Strength, and <clears throat> we are encountering in our passage uh, probably the, well -known, the most well-known story in the whole entire book of Judges. We're going to read the lion's share of the story of Gideon, the most famous section of that story. And we are going to see how Gideon tests God when God tells him to go to war against the Midianites. But more importantly, you and I together are going to examine the source of Gideon's strength. We're going to see what Gideon's strength actually was. So uh, please stand with me for our scripture reading. Again, this is the main section on Gideon. And so it's, it's like last week. It's a, it's a few more verses than what uh, we may normally read. We're going to be reading chapter 6, verse 34 through 7, verses 25. So if you have your Bibles, you can take them out. We're going to reference different sections throughout here uh, later as well during the sermon. This is the word of the Lord. 6.34, so the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and the Bezerites were called to, together to follow him. He sent messengers through Manasseh, and, and they also were called together to follow him. And he sent ma messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. Then Gideon said to God, if you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry all on all the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed out the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not let your anger burn against me, that I may speak once more. Please, let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and let there be dew on all the ground. God did so that night, for it was dry only on the fleece, and dew was on all the ground. 
Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. For Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now therefore, come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Therefore it shall be that he of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So we brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink the water. The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hands. So let all the other people go, each man to his own home. So the 300 men men took the people's provisions and their trumpets into their hands. And Gideon sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tent but retained the 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Now, that same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it it into your hands. But if you are afraid to go down, go with Pua, your servant, down to the camp, and you will hear what they say, and afterward your hands will be strengthened that you might go down against the camp. So he went with Pua, his servant, down to the outpost of the army that was in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were laying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. When Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian. And it came to the tent, and it struck it so that it fell. And it turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. His friend replied, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. He divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them with torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I and all who are with me blow the trumpet, then you also blow the trumpets all around the camp and say, for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came to the outskirt of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. When they had just posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. When the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing and cried, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran, crying out as they fled. When they blew three hundred trumpets, the Lord set the sword of one against the uh, against. Another even throughout the whole army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah toward Zerah, as far as the edge of Abel Mahola by Tabith. The men of Israel were summoned from Naphtali and Asher and all Manasseh, and they pursued Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against Midian and take the waters before them as far as Beth Bara and the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were summoned, and they took the waters as far as Beth Bara and the Jordan. They captured the two leaders of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and they killed Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. While they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon from across the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray together before we get in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the way in which it instructs us. It is a a guide to our feet, a light to our path. 
Um, but, Father, it doesn't just enlighten our physical path. It enlightens the path of our heart. It, it casts light into the darkness of our mind. And it exposes where we are wrong. So, Father, expose our wrong thinking. And expose the wrong action that always goes along with our wrong thinking about you and about ourselves. Father, make us a humble people. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I mentioned, this is one of the, probably the most popular story in the book of Judges. And rightfully so, the author of Judges spends more time talking about this man, Gideon, than he does anyone else in the book. Now, that's not saying that Gideon is the best of the judges or the most valiant, but he does spend the most time there. There's actually uh, uh, more chapters given to Samson, who's the, who's the last judge in the book of Judges. Now, we know that Samson isn't actually the last judge. The last judge is Samuel. And yet, in this book, Samson's the last judge. He has more chapters given to him, but there's more verses given to Gideon. So Gideon's a really popular story. Gideon is a man who's popular because he has great faith, as the author of Hebrews declares. And yet, Gideon is a man, kind of like Peter in the New Testament, whose sins, whose fears, whose doubts lay right on the surface. His own sense of his inadequacy is right there before us. And all these things, his strength and courage as well as his sins, are laid bare for us to see. And I, the Lord has, has done this in his word, not just so that we can make commentary about this man Gideon, but so that we have eyes to see ourselves. I think Gideon is a man that we should relate to. He should remind us of who we are. So last week, we got into the story of Gideon. And in our passage last week, the, the beginning of chapter 6, we heard that God appeared to Gideon while Gideon was hunkering down in a hole in the ground that was served as his wine press to beat out his wheat because he was afraid of the Midianites. And God appears to him, and <clears throat> I want to read just a little bit, uh, uh, one phrase that we read last week because we're going to be using this phrase to serve as our launch point this week. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and he said these words to him. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. You can imagine how spooked Gideon was. He's down there hunkering down and all of a sudden you have an angel of the Lord, probably a very fierce warlike figure. The Lord is with you. To which Gideon amazingly sort of responds, well, you could have fooled me. That's essentially Gideon's response. He's skeptic. He's jaded because what the Lord said, when he said, the Lord is with you, didn't match his own experience. God's word said, I'm with you, and yet Gideon was at this very moment all alone, hunkering down in this hole in the rock because he believed that God hadn't been with them. He believed that God had not been good to them. He believed that God didn't care like he once did when he led Israel out of Egypt under the hand of Moses. Because he contrasts his current predicament with what God had formerly done. The Lord is with you. Oh, well, if he is with us, then why are we like we are? Where is he? Why has he not delivered us like he once did? Why were things so bad? Gideon actually believes that his own experience testifies against God's and that his own experience wins out over what God's word says. And he actually says, the Lord has abandoned us. That's what Gideon believes is true in his heart. Now listen to God's response to Gideon. From chapter 6, once again, again, we're reaching back here. The Lord looked at him. The Lord looked at him. And he said, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Wow. 
The Lord looked at him. Now, I read a verse like that. And if I'm reading attentively so that I pick up on the fact that it says the Lord looked at him, I instantly interpret that verse through the lens of my childhood when my dad would give me the look. Who knows what the look is? Yeah, many of us do. The look. No more explanation is needed. Gideon is complaining and testifying against what God has told him based off his own experience, based off what he has seen and heard and felt and tasted, or not tasted, wish he had tasted, and the Lord gives him the look, the look, followed by a command. Go in this your strength and deliver the people of Israel from the hand of Midian. So I want to ask you this morning, what was the strength Gideon was to go in? In other words, what was the this referring to when God said to him, go in this your strength? Was the source, what was the source of Gideon's strength? And as we think about Gideon, I want to ask you the same question. What is the source of your strength? What is it really? I'm not asking you what the right answer is. I'm asking you, what is the source of your strength? To answer our question about the source of Gideon's strength, I want to look down through the passage that we read together, and I want to draw some conclusions this morning. But before we do that, I do want to remind us of just one other thing that we were told from last week in our passage. God appears to Gideon. He says, go in this your strength and deliver Israel. But right after he says that the Lord is with Gideon, I was kind of cheating. I I didn't read the whole phrase. He actually said, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. That was actually the way that the angel of the Lord addressed Gideon. He said, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now some look at this and take this greeting as tongue-in-cheek. They say that God's really actually just poking fun at Gideon because here he is crouched down in a hole, afraid of the enemy, And so God is basically mocking him. Now, I'm not convinced of this reading because the chapters given to Gideon in Judges, as well as the testimony of the author of Hebrews, give us a picture of this judge, and that picture is, in fact, of a valiant warrior. If we actually read about Gideon and we read the New Testament of Gideon, it says, I don't have time, the author of Hebrews says, I don't have time to talk about the strength and the faith of those men who waged battle and saved. So... It doesn't seem to match. If God is just mocking Gideon, it, it seems to, that, that interpretation goes against really everything else we read of him as a warrior. I don't take the Lord's address here as mockery, but as a sincere greeting and as a helpful descriptor of his character. And, on top of that, I take it as God's encouragement to Gideon to do the thing that he's going to call him to do in just a few moments. God encourages us. So I think he's encouraging Gideon by saying, the Lord is with you, a valiant warrior. After all, he was brave, and he was a fighter. And don't you think that God would appear to him and choose him because of this character? Yes. These are the kind of men that God seeks. The scripture says, the Lord is looking for a man who is willing to be used by him. Right? So... He says, oh, valiant warrior. Gideon is a valiant warrior. God says that he is, and in our passage, we see that he plays the man. And when he leads the charge down the mountain with these 300 men against the hordes of the Midianites, he doesn't do so as a man who's a novice, a novice, rather, with the game of war. He knows how to formulate a plan of attack. I know we read a lot of verses together, but if you took a little more time, and, and, and there was some strategy that was unpacked as Gideon formulated his plan to to go down and attack the Midianites. He is familiar, obviously, with war history and with battle tactics. If you've ever studied, anybody ever studied warfare history, any history buffs, yeah. Um, If you ever have read much about battles, then you know that there is a sense in which war is very uh, similar to something like football or some other sport. There are tactics that are employed And, in fact, different generals and commanders throughout history have been known for using certain movements and tactics 
in warfare. So you know in high school football, you watch the films on other teams and you study the patterns because you know that those patterns are likely the patterns in place that are going to be run against you. Well, it's very much the same in war. Different generals were well known for certain routes and certain tactics. And Gideon obviously has done his research because what's interesting is that Gideon's, <laughs> we don't know for sure, but really the tactic that Gideon employs when he runs down in the middle of the night in three different companies is the exact same tactic that many of us read about at the beginning of our small group year when we read about Abraham going to rescue Lot. Same thing, same tactic. Maybe he even was aware of this tactic from reading about Abraham a couple hundred years before. Gideon is a warrior, he's a valiant warrior, and he knows how to wage war. Gideon's, so, was Gideon's strength and military prowess what God was referencing when he said, go in this your strength? Was that what God was referencing? Well, with this as our question, I want to jump down to the end of chapter 6 that we read this morning. Gideon is now, has now faithfully toppled his household idols, and he's lived to tell the tale. And in chapter 6, verse 33, we read, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves together. They crossed over and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. The Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. Okay, he's summoning people to himself. And the Abizarites were called together to follow him, and he sent out messengers. And they gathered those from Manasseh, and he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and, and the different tribes are coming up. You can picture the scene. As all those who hate the Lord make common cause with each other against God's people, as they always do, Gideon is sounding the alarm and drawing people ready to defend and to fight against the Midianites, the Malachites, and the sons of the east. Gideon's sails have caught the wind. He's got his trumpet. He's summoning these various tribes to arise, like Deborah. Remember Deborah? Arise! And they're coming together for common cause to fight and overthrow the bonds of their captors. And though morale is generally low, remember, at this point, people are beat down. They're, they're, they're beating their wheat in the wine press. That's the morale. Though it's a it's sort of depressing time for Israel, the people are responding to the call. They are coming. They're coming out. And then at this climactic point, we hit verse 36. And as all these people are sort of coming out and converging together in one big confluence together, Gideon is surrounded with warriors from different tribes, and the enemy is encamped down at the base of the valley. You can picture this scene in your mind. Then right here, right at the threshold of battle, Gideon starts thinking. And he starts having some second thoughts about the matter. Trumpet in his hand, a growing sense of doubt in his heart. This reminds me of, I, you could pick your analogy here. Uh, this past winter, I was going sledding with my kids, and I decided to take some of the younger kids up the hill. And, you know, the, I think an Eagle Scout project put in some steps at the sledding hill, but they're always covered in ice. And so, you know, I'm carrying this kid, carrying this kid, carrying the sled, trying to not slip on the ice. I hike up the hill, wait my turn in line, plop the sled down, get down on it, start hoisting my kid onto my lap, and then what happens? No! They, they don't want to go down the hill anymore, right? <laughs> they had watched their older brother go down the hill. They wanted to go down the hill. They were excited to go down the hill. Daddy, would you take me? Daddy, would you take me? Daddy, would you take me? I took them up there, and then they want to go down, you know? And not down the hill. They want to go down the steps, you know? And this is, this is, <laughs> this is kind of like getting into this point. Imagine it. All these tribes banding together. They've got fear in their hearts, but they're acting courageously. They're coming out to fight. And then right at the threshold, battle. Oh, Gideon, oh, do I really want to do this? Oh, am I going to my, is this suicide? Is this a suicide mission? God had told him, remember, God had told him in the last chapter, you're going to defeat Midian. Remember that. Go in this your strength. Remember he had said, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. He knew what God had said. But oh, oh, 
right at the threshold of battle. Here we go. 36, 636, Gideon said to God, If you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, behold, I'm going to put a fleece out on the threshing floor. And if there's dew on the fleece only and it's dry on the ground, then I'll know that you'll deliver Israel as you have spoken. Now here's the deal. Earlier I asked what the source of Gideon's strength was. And now, now we are getting a picture of what Gideon thought his strength was. If you will, if you're going to deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, prove yourself. Show me. Show me. Now this is such a helpful passage for us. Because this is exactly the sort of way we want to dress up our unbelief. He doesn't come out and say that he doesn't believe God. He's not there on the precipice of war and then turning and saying, you have abandoned us, God. He says, if, if, if you're going to do this, he dresses it up. He says, if you're going to deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, though his words sound very dependent and very humble, um, it is never humble it is never humble or dependent to distrust, to doubt what God has already told you. Gideon's words sound very humble here. They sound humble because we talk the same way and we would like to think that we're humble. It is not humility. When God has told you to do something and he said that he will be with you, to go back to him and say, prove it. That's not humility. You can dress it up with nice theological words, you can wrap it in prayer, but it's not humble. Now, we see the mercy of God here. He doesn't, he doesn't just incinerate Gideon. He works with Gideon, and he works with us. But don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, Gideon's such a humble guy. We like to think that because we ourselves are like him. <clears throat> Listen, Gideon made the mistake of thinking that his strength was his own. He started down this way of thinking last chapter. I'll remind you that when he said, go out in this your strength, immediately Gideon responds by saying, not saying, thank you, Lord, I'll trust you. God says, go out and deliver Israel in this your strength. And Gideon's immediate response to him at that point is, but I am from the lowest of the tribes. I'm from the smallest of the tribes. We see it there. His immediate response is to look inward to his strength. He does it. You understand, God's saying, I will be with you. And he's saying, but I, not you, Lord, I. His focus is on himself. <clears throat> Wasn't there a man better equipped? Wasn't there a man better suited? So Gideon has started down this path of inward thinking. And here, as the battles are drawing near, we see into his mind that his line of thinking hasn't changed. Now, you might say that this, this request seems humble of God. It seems dependent on God. God Gideon says, if you will deliver Israel. And yet the very fact that he's asking for visible proof makes it clear that he does not trust God's word. And if he does not trust God's word, then how in the world can he be resting in God's strength to secure a victory over an army that is described as being more numerous in its soldiers than the sand on the seashore? How on earth can he be trusting God for strength if he doesn't trust what God has promised him? He can't. And you can't either. We like the sound of Gideon's requests because we formulate our requests and we frame in our tests in the exact same ways. It sounds like it has a whole lot to do with God and with God's strength, but the reality is, is that it has far more to do with us. The skepticism of if, if, if we are sitting in judgment on, on God and what he said when we start by saying if, if, if. And we aren't better than Gideon. We aren't any more pious. Remember the author of Hebrews says that Gideon was a man of faith. We aren't more faithful, more spiritual than this man. So we aren't to look down our noses at him and we aren't to, to dress him up and to pretend that his failures and sins weren't really so bad. In the years of Jesus' ministry, it was precisely those that didn't trust Jesus that asked him for signs, wasn't it? And he had little patience for it. They had the testimony of God through the mouths of the prophets, and no more signs would be given. If you put your stock in what you can see, then you are not looking to God to be your source of strength. It's that simple. 
if you are depending on what you see, you are not trusting God to be your strength. God has already appeared to Gideon. He's commissioned him to do his work. He's promised that he would surely be with him in defeating the Midianites. His presence was to be their strength. And on top of that, this whole prove yourself to me business had already happened once. Just a few days before likely. Remember last week we said that Gideon said, if, if you are who you say you are, let, I'm going to offer a sacrifice. And show yourself to me. And remember that the flames came and it consumed the sacrifice. And, and when that happened, Gideon stood back and said, oh, alas, I've seen God. It's not like God hasn't sought to prove himself to Gideon already. And here again, he's asking for it. Then when Gideon asked for a sign with the fleece, and then a second sign with the fleece, he did so because he did not believe what God had said. He needed further proof. If he didn't believe God, then he certainly was not looking to God to be his source of strength, which is to say he was looking to himself. He was looking to himself. You don't test what you trust. Do you understand that? We've already mentioned this past week, we were, many of us were camping. And one of the new technological advancements of the last 20 years has been camp chairs that get smaller and smaller and smaller. So I was at a campsite, and there was a chair sitting around, and you always, you know, squat chairs on the camping site. Which Who has my chair, by the way? I'm coming for you. This is this little chair. They get smaller and smaller. You know, I'm used to the ones with the four posts. Well, this one was, it was like a backpacking edition. And I was pretty skeptical to sit on it because it was so small. And I am not that small, right? I'm like, is this a kid's chair? He's like, no, it's a backpacking chair. I didn't want to break a guy's chair. Well, anyway, I tested it because I've broken chairs before. This thing didn't look like it could hold my weight. I didn't trust it. So I sat down in it a little bit, and I rocked around to test and see whether or not the chair would hold me. Now, it did. But you don't test what you trust. You understand this. I don't have to use the stupid chair analogy that always gets used. I can move on. How about your marriage? In your marriage, you don't test your spouse if you trust them. If you're always testing your spouse, it's a sign that the trust has been breached, isn't it? It's a sign that you really need to build something that's not there if you're testing so this is true. We don't test what we trust. Gideon didn't trust God. But he did trust his own ability to test God. You understand that? He thinks that this device he's thought up in his mind with the fleece bit on the ground will convince him of something that God has already told him of. Do you understand? It's so clear Gideon trusts himself here over God. He believes in his own ability to test God. He believed that his fleece test would accomplish something for him that God's promise and presence had not. And many of us like the idea of admitting that trusting God is hard, but we need to be honest that we don't trust God. It's easy to say, well, trusting him is hard to do. But we don't like to just admit that we don't trust him. We lean on our own understanding. We lean on our own strength. Gideon's testing of the Lord revealed that when the Lord said, go in this your strength, Gideon thought the strength he was to go in was his own. That's what this story reveals. Now we often hear <clears throat> about Gideon's tests with the fleece. But there's another pair of tests here in this chapter that occurs. Maybe you caught them. The second set of tests come from the Lord himself, and they are aimed at Gideon and at Israel. Now, you might say, well, these aren't tests. These are tests. The Lord says in 7, verse 2, the people who are with you, Gideon, are too many for me to deliver Midian into their hands. Therefore, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, for Israel will become boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. It's too many. I can't do it with this many people, because if, you, if all these 30, 30, 32,000 people go out, I know what you're going to do. You're going you're to go out and you're going to have a victory and you're going to claim that victory as your own. Now, therefore, tell every coward here who doesn't have the guts to fight to go home. So Gideon does. Can you imagine being Gideon at this point? You're already scared to go up against this horde in the valley. 
People come out to meet you when you blew your trumpet. You've gathered them. And now you realize that 32, uh, I'm sorry, 22,000 of those soldiers were so afraid that they, took, they opted out immediately. Do you imagine what, is, what Gideon would have felt like as 22,000 men were like, oh, don't need to tell me twice. It's de- it would be devastating. Devastating. <laughs> oh, Of course, this doesn't mean that the 10,000 that remained weren't afraid. You understand that. And if they weren't afraid beforehand, after they lost 22,000 of their fellow soldiers, I'm sure they were afraid. Now, it just means that they weren't willing to admit it. And of course, there are some good reasons to not have 22,000 cowards by your side. Who wants cowards fighting against you on your side of battle? Well, there's a good reason why God might have done that. But that's not the reason God did it. God did it so that they wouldn't boast. Often God works in ways in our lives where he accomplishes many things There's maybe one overarching purpose, but God has many, many purposes in our lives. So he just hacks off 22,000 of these men. The other 10,000 men had to have been scared. In fact, we know they were scared because later, when God sends Gideon down to the enemy camp, remember, to encourage him. This is after he's down to 300 men. God says, go down to the camp and listen to what the Midianites are saying. And he says, but if you're afraid to go down, take your servant. He took the servant, right? Gideon isn't trying to pretend he's not afraid. Gideon's afraid. All these guys are afraid. They've got Gideon. They've got 10,001. Gideon and the 10,000 against now the hordes of the Amalekites, the Midianites, and the, the kings of the east. Gideon's strength has just been decimated by God. And then it's like me around the campfire when it comes to more time. Hmm think I'll have another. Hmm. One test wasn't enough for God. Gideon's got 10,000. And then he says, hmm, I'm going to do a second test, may I? Does this sound familiar? You think Gideon might have been thinking, maybe I should have stuck with the one test. God says, the people are still too many for me. Bring them down to the water and I'll test them again. And so then he says, basically, Had them all go down, those that stuck their heads into the water and lapped like dogs, he sent home, and those that brought the water up to their mouth, he kept. He said, you can keep those, and there were only 300 of them. And I don't know, there's a whole lot of words spilled on the pages of books that make much of this stooping down and thrusting your head into the water versus bringing it up, and I'm not sure I buy any of it. The point was to shave the numbers down. God can do that any way he wants. As we compare Gideon's tests to God's tests, God seems to respond in a way that says, Gideon, your tests were far too small. Try these on for size, right? Try these on for size. You want me to prove my strength to you? Well, here it is. Let me prove it. Gideon has tested God, and now God has tested Gideon and all of Israel with him. They're going to fight against the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the sons of the east, and they're going to do so with less than 1% of the original army when the original army had been small in comparison. Now, for a second time, Gideon and Israel's strength has been decimated by God. Now, whereas Gideon tested God to prove his power, God tested Gideon to prove to Gideon his powerlessness. You understand that? Gideon tested God, said, show me your power. Give me assurance of it. God turns around and tests Gideon to prove to Gideon just how weak and powerless he actually was. He being Gideon. God was going to ensure that all Israel had nothing to become boastful about. No strength of their own to lean on. It was all going to be him. Like Gideon, we test God because we doubt his strength. Our natural propensity is to lean on our own understanding. That's why the scripture says, don't do it. The scripture knows that leaning on your own understanding, leaning on your own strength is natural. We like to live our lives, no matter how we believe the world was created, we often have a tendency to live survival of the fittest and 
by our own bootstraps, we will make our lives. It's going to be by our own strength. It's going to be by our own understanding. It's going to be by our own abilities. And Jesus says, no, don't lean on those things. Depend on me. God tests us in order to display his strength. God's testing of Gideon revealed that when he had said, go in this your strength, he meant that he, he, God, would be Gideon's strength. Gideon's success wouldn't be founded on the fact that he was a valiant warrior. After all, to have military success, you have to have a military. And God had stripped him of that. God had taken that from Gideon so that he might learn what the real source of his strength was. What is the source of your strength? Don't give yourself an easy answer. Consider what the source of your strength is. I'm not asking what it should be. I'm not asking what the right answer is. I'm asking, what do you depend on? What is the source of your strength? What do you put your faith in? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul speaks about the power of God in contrast with his own weakness. Familiar passage to those of us that are, are believers. And Paul says, in order to keep him from exalting himself, because this is our own natural propensity, even for a man such as Paul. Think about Paul. What was Paul's life given to Well, the life of ministry. He was a church planner. He was a pastor. He was an apostle. And yet God said to keep from exalting yourself, even though you're a righteous man, righteous men can exalt themselves and lean on their own strength. Fight it. In order to humble him and to keep him from not resting on his own laurels and doing things by his own strength, God had afflicted him and given him, Satan was allowed to test him with with this thorn in the flesh. Paul goes on to write that on three occasions he had asked the Lord to take this thing from him. And God had said no. God had said no, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Power is perfected in weakness. Now, what does that mean? Power and weakness seem like opposites of each other. How can weakness perfect power? It seems illogical, and yet this is what God says to Paul. He says, you've got to be content with it. Power is perfected in weakness. Paul understands it, too. It's what Paul says to Gideon. I'm sorry, this is what, it's what God says to Gideon, essentially. And it's what he says to you. Power is perfected in weakness. If you look to yourself as your source of strength, you're going to live a weak, impotent, and very sad life because things are not going to go as you've pleased. And if you're depending on your own power, you cannot rest in what you've perceived as failure because it is failure and and it goes back to you. You understand that if you depend on the power of God, when you are met with failure, you can still trust God. Because he has a plan. And if you're living by faith, you can trust him, even if it doesn't feel good. But if you're dependent on yourself, oh my, there's no hope. There's only despair and sadness and regret. But we as Christians aren't to live there, are we? No. We aren't to view ourselves as the ones with strength. But if you see your own weakness and look to God for strength, his power will be perfected in you. The power of God will be perfected in us when we come to an end in ourselves. His power will be perfected in us as we realize the utter worthlessness that we can offer him in our own strength. Now, God is pleased to show himself strong to those who aren't inflated on their own strengths. But he has nothing to do with the proud. He opposes the proud. Power is perfected in weakness. Now, one caveat that I have to make here is that seeing your own inadequacy and running to the power of God has nothing to do with the modern notion that's propagated in the evangelical church at large that we are to embrace and rest easy in our own weakness. There are many today who elevate the idea of embracing weakness in a way that is actually unbiblical and unhelpful. They speak of our inability to do anything right, But they also put forward the idea that we should almost expect failure, at least when it comes to be at perfect peace with it, because that's what all we're capable of. And while we understand, we have to understand that we will and we do fail and sin, 
And while we must have a biblical understanding of how sinful and weak we are, and we are, Jesus Christ did not die and spill his blood so that we could remain weak and pitiful. He died and rose because we are precious to him and so that we might live in newness of life, not by our own strengths, but by his. And that's the lie. People want to say, embrace weak, that you're weak, just embrace it. Well, we are weak, and yet the power of Christ transforms us. It's not by our own power, but he gives us his power. And how weak is the power of Christ? It's not weak at all. So please don't perf- confuse. Please don't confuse Paul's humble words with the very modern, proud notion that we are who we are and it's all good with God, so just rest easy in our weakness. Don't strive, there's no point, we're weak. That's not what Paul means here. But power is perfected in weakness. Think about Gideon on the battlefield. He still went out and killed it, didn't he? Gideon's story and the others in Hebrews 11 aren't men who are content and comfortable just in their weakness and patheticness. They exchange their weakness, they exchange it for the power of God. There's nothing in us that's strong and mighty. That's the lesson God's teaching Gideon here. But we do have a strength. It's God's strength. And it's so much better than anything, any strength we could have conjured up in and of ourselves. So God doesn't lend his strength to those who will use it for their own glory. And he says to Gideon and to Paul that he is concerned that you not grow boastful and proud. And he knows how prone you are to the pride of life. And so he is happy to decimate your strength so that you will depend on his. As we close, I want to ask what the source of your strength is. It's not the first time I've asked it. I hope you've been considering it. But I want to ask you where the source of your strength is found. Is it found in your own abilities? Is it found in your own identity? Is it found in your resources, your possessions, your contacts? Is it found in your children? Is it found in your knowledge of the Bible or of theology? Or is the source of your strength the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course, I've been saying it. We all know what the right answer is. And yet, as we've said, we are such suckers for self-inflation aren't we? We are such suckers to blow ourselves up and to think things about us that just are simply not true. And so I, I want to ask if, what the source of your strength is, and I want to say that if you want your own glory, then you're trying to do things in your own strength. If you find throughout life, you go through life seeking your own glory, you're doing it by your own strength. If you live testing God, You're doing it by your own strength. And I think that in certain circles in the church, there's language like, lay a fleece, lay a fleece. Well, I haven't heard that here. But listen, we test God. We do. You may not lay out a fleece, but you sure do test God. If you live in fear, then you're testing God. I don't know. I I could point to probably in the circumstances, if they're in any given situation, how I won't do it now. Fear always causes us to test God. You realize that. Gideon's fear caused him to test God. If you live in fear, if you live in fear, then you live testing God. And that is to trust in your own strength. If you live conservatively, always making sure to go in the direction where you know exactly how to handle yourself, where you never have to make too big of risks. When you go through life just saying, I'm waiting on a door to open, that's, that's something we say, waiting on a door to open, waiting on a door to open, we're testing Often, we, there's never, there are times where we have to wait and see if God opens the door. But often, that's a way that we can t- essentially say we're testing God. If you don't trust his word, you're test, you live on your own strength. If you don't trust his word, you live on your own strength. It's, it's an incredible thing. Think about it. He heard from the voice of the angel of the Lord that he would defeat Midian. Didn't he? What convinced him? He heard it from the mouth of a man. Isn't that crazy? He had already heard it straight from the mouth of God. And yet it's a man relating a dream. And I've heard some crazy dreams that don't come true. That actually convinced Gideon. If you live doubting the word of God, 
you're resting in your own strength. Now, we see in the end that Gideon gets it. He realizes that the outcome of the battle isn't going to be determined by the number of his troops or by his skill, but by the strength and the power of God. The power of God was perfected in the weakness of those 300 men. We can tell that Gideon finally gets it because his brilliant uh, plan of attack included uh, some things that most generals would leave out and didn't include some of the things that most generals would want, mainly weapons. They probably had weapons somewhere on their person, but in their hand, they've got a trumpet and they've got a torch covered by a pot. That's what they're using to wage war. He is now living with God as his strength, and Gideon's actions, as he runs into battle, testify to the fact that he is not dependent on himself, but on God. Don't you see that if he was dependent, his, the very things he holds in his hands to wage war testify to the fact that he's now looking to God to be his strength, because he doesn't even have a sword. So you see it. You see that now, after these trials and after these various incidents that he and God have gone through together in the last couple of chapters, Gideon embraces what God has said is true, and he's leaning on the Lord for his strength. God delivers Israel from the Midianites with 300 men that didn't hold weapons in their hands. This is the strength of our God, and this is the strength that he offers to you. Do you depend on it? Do you live by it, or are you trying to get it done in your own strength? God offers you immense, all his strength. And I pray that it will be said of us, like Moses and like David both said, the Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. That's what I hope for us. Let's pray.